Tom. Yeah, just while I'm while I'm waiting for the first uh, the first question, Christine, you you raised some interesting aspects. You're looking, I, I think you said about seven cents a ton for the cost of a classification system for your council. If you start and look at the whole supply chain though and look at the cost of having a quality system right through the supply chain, have you started to look at what the cost of that is? Because there's obviously a cost in segregation, a cost in transport, a cost in storage, those things above and beyond a system where you didn't have quality. Is this on? Um, no, we haven't done that because it's, it's actually a huge task. We don't have the information available to actually make those sorts of investigations. But I'm sure there has been some work done before about handling logis and logistics end of the grains chain and where the inefficiencies are. And, but I don't, see, I don't expect that's changed very much in a number of years. Um, I recall from that piece of work, which is in the buried in the back of my head, that there were significant efficiencies to be gained um, and improved productivity in this, just in the storage and handling system itself. Um, to actually undertake that would require, I think, input from all of the companies in that sector and aggregate the information so that you can draw some conclusions from it. I don't know how willing they'd be to participate in that, but you can bet your life that individually they're all very intent on minimising their own costs wherever they can for the maximum return that they can get. Fair enough. Um, Andrew, you, you did your Nuffield, you were looking at the... Um adoption of GM crops or commercialisation of GM crops. Do you, see a, do you see a role there in your farming system with your livestock? Yeah, well, um, we quite like Roundup Ready Canola as a grazing a crop to graze. You can um, seed early and get reasonably good weed control early with your first Roundup application and then graze the crop and then we come back in afterwards when we've opened the canopy back up and you can get good... Um, coverage onto your weeds um, for any late germinated weeds so it's worked well in our system and you know I have to say when I did my Nuffield it was all about um, an endpoint royalty system to pay for the technology and um, uh, it's it's working well in the wheat industry where we've got good investment now from a lot of multinational companies investing into the wheat breeding system I really feel that the old industry to go forward we need to get some of the upfront costs out of the way and defer it with an endpoint royalty system and share some of the risk because in more marginal areas it's just cost prohibitive yeah. Thanks, I have a question straight up here it's Peter Rowe from CSPC here um, got a question for Peter about your forward price projections and it really relates to corn industrial usage in the US and just whether you factored in the coal seam gas leading to possible US independence on on fuel and then what that's going to do for ethanol production when when the corn acre is coming out of corn and possibly going elsewhere and if you factor that in and what that impact that may have on future price. When, when, we, when we look at um, the uh, ethanol production in the corn thing, we, we look at the, um, what all the factors are going to uh, lead to the demand for corn and, and of course that's going to be, uh, or the demand for ethanol uh, and the, the mandates have been important to that. Um, and of course we look at, um, uh, is production ethanol going to go up to those, um, up to those mandates? and the factors that might determine that, and that's the kind of things that you're talking about, the things that might uh, affect the demand for ethanol. Did, did that answer your question? Yeah, I think. Yeah, uh, Richard. Um, Richard Heath, Nuffield, Australia. A question for Christine. I was really interested in that modelling and, and um, the call that, uh, that um, uh, classification has, has the most effect or most benefit for growers than anyone else. Um, there is some argument that the, as you talked about, the classification system impact on what varieties are released uh, does put some uh, constraint on the breeding industry in terms of what they are able to release. 
um, and whether um, you know that yield versus quality trade-off, whether that was factored into that calculation and that if there was less uh, constraint on that classification, higher yielding varieties were able to be released that you know, didn't necessarily have the same amount of quality, whether that was worked into that modelling or not. Um, no, it wasn't, Richard. Um, we really, to do it at all, um, we had to look for a very simple concept of what um, value the system that we've got delivers and the way that that was done was to compare, um, to take feed wheat as the base price and then to look at the next lowest price for wheat above feed wheat. So while it's, so in one sense, in an, e in an economic sense, that's a very simplistic model, but it did what we needed it to do. Um, we've got lots of other work we need to do in this system, but this was our starting point because in order to justify any of it, um, the industry needs to know that classification is valuable and if it is valuable, where does the value fall across the system and how is, how is it distributed and what decisions does it allow different sectors of the chain to make. Um, so that's, that was the sole focus of our, our little piece of economic modelling. However, that's a really valid question. Um, we've had some major work done on the um, existing system which raises a number of other questions like that and, and actually to address it, I think would require um, a lot more complex modelling than what we actually did, but it's a pretty interesting question. Um, I'm sorry, I can't give you an answer. I think readers would like an answer as well. But that's just an example of how a system now needs to evolve. We're in an environment that's completely different from what we've ever had. Um, and so suddenly there's intense focus on um, extracting maximum value at different parts of the chain and particularly by growers who, who want more flexibility in the sorts of production decisions that they can make and uh, what are the parts in the chain from the breeding end that allow you to do that. So it's an indicator of the work that actually needs to be done in this system now, in, now that we're facing a completely different market environment from what we've had in the past. So there's a gentleman here and then I have a lady in the white jacket. Uh, it's Mark Narrowstrang from CBH Group. Uh, question for Christine. Uh, Christine, uh, I like your quote, which was quality is uh, demand driven. Um, could you please explain how your um, uh, classification system incorporates uh, overseas demand? Um, so where a good qu uh, quantity of our exports, uh, particularly wheat, um, uh, ends up. Um, so like, for example, Southeast Asia, North Asia. Um, in simplistic terms, 75% um, of the Australian crop is exported. So all of our market information, um, we've got local, um, local processes, the flour millers and the food manufacturing companies. Food manufacturing companies are the only ones who are not actually part of the Wheat Classification Council. I have a view about that. They would really like an entree. Um, our council has on it everybody from breeders, has a couple of growers. Um, it's well represented by bulk, um, bulk handlers and exporters. So and flour millers. So the market, we rely on them because they deal with the final customers in all of the markets into which Australian wheat is sold both domestically and internationally. So we rely on the council for, um, to distill the information that they're willing to bring into the council to feed it back to the breeders and particularly to the variety classification panel. How they do that is a very subjective process. I think we could introduce a great deal more objectivity into this process, but it's, it's really taken the two years, the council only meets twice a year, but there are a lot of subgroups that meet all the way through the year, but um, they just keep finding more and more things to do and more and more challenges and more and more questions to which we don't know the answers. And we keep seeing scope for increasing objectivity in this system and we don't have it. Um, when it was within the control of AWB, it was a lot more objective and it was simpler because they had control of the, basically, you know, most of the crop and they had control of most of the marketing. So they had all the information captured within one corporate structure and we don't have that now. So we have um, a range of organisations marketing um, wheat into um, hundreds of different sorts of markets and trying to capture the information um, that's not commercially sensitive, because no one's going to reveal commercially sensitive information, back into the council relies on a level of, I guess, generic knowledge. Um, they very carefully look at the issues that they need to consider. Um, we haven't had any problems, I think, to date, except for once with 
that we're overstepping the mark into what might be commercially sensitive. Mostly the breeders don't need commercially sensitive information. We're looking for long-term trend data, basically, um, which is not um, immediate market sales information or what's being bought or sold in any particular place. It's what's happening over the long term, what are the trend lines. We're not particularly interested in what's happening right this minute other than how it might affect a trend line. And so that sort of information quite, um, um, quite freely comes back into the council and that's where it's captured. Thank you. Thank you. Sue Bestow currently at DAF. Question for Andrew if I could please. Um, in the 1990s, there was a fair bit of research done on early grazed crops um, up in the Geraldton region, um, which I had a, a small amount of involvement in. Um, the question to you really is whether or not the system that you have, have put together, which is clearly highly profitable and very efficient, is that based on your research, department or publicly funded research? And if so, what effect does extension, agricultural extension have and the possible demise of the publicly funded extension services on the type of cropping systems that you put together? Thank you. I guess the catalyst for us was copying what one of my neighbours was doing. And, um, and I think that that was a Nuffield Scholar who saw some crop grazing in Kansas. But to adapt it into our system and get some more rigour about the risks, I suppose, the rules of when you have to be out on cereals, we just picked that, you know, the growth stage work up, um, I think, with some support from grain and graze, but not much. We're sort of leading the research in our own area and, um, and uh, have been more involved in workshops and stuff since we implemented the, the, the concept, but it was really working with the grower groups, local grow growers working together and, and um, you know, learning from some of our mistakes. And I think that, you know, you don't want to be at the front of everything because you're going to make more mistakes. So when you see something that works and that you can see a role for it in your business, that's the, that's the time to move. But uh, obviously at some point you, ha you end up in front and you have to start um, developing the technology you want to implement as you go, but it's certainly not without risks. Uh, Dave Brown, Hill Grain Farmer, Liverpool Plains. Um, uh, I've been lucky enough to come to ABF for probably the last five years in a row. And Peter, I'll start with you. I think it's my annual dose of depression in the grains industry. It prices down 10 per cent, production up. Um, yeah. And I, I always hope that something else happens, but maybe it doesn't always happen. Um, land values continue to rise, and Andrew d demonstrated that. Like we would get a, a return of about 7 per cent on our assets managed. He gets 13, so perhaps I need to move to Esperance. Uh, I'm not sure there's enough room for Andrew and I there. Um, I was asked when I came, I'll get to a question in a sec, but I was asked when I came in here which faction of the grains industry I was going to represent today, and I think it's just the concerned faction I'll represent today, which I think is probably all of us in the grains industry, but what's next? Is it, is it value adding? Um, you know, what's the next step we're going to look for in the grains industry to really make the next big difference to all three of you? Well, I think um, it I was talking about uh, um, the need of, uh, to improve productivity or continue to strive for productivity growth um, in the production side of the industry. Um, we've heard from Christine and also people yesterday that um, people, a lot of people believe that the existing technology would um, direct kill and that sort of thing. A lot of, a lot of the gains have already been, already been got from, from that and that there's uh, probably going to be uh, need for uh, additional investment in research and development to develop new technologies to um, give that uh, productivity um, boost to kick along. Um, at the same time, there are probably um, growers out there, uh, and Andrew and um, John, Gla uh, John Gladigar yesterday uh, have shown that there are still improvements that can be made uh, within the existing technologies that exist. Um, I'm involved in the grains count, um, the advisory council for CBH, and been exposed to their investment into the flour mills in Southeast Asia. And that business has been returning over 25% return on capital year on year. You know, you build a new flour mill in Vietnam, and it's at full produ full production in months, not years. So the demand up there is huge, and. We've seen that in the, the uh, growth in the market for wheat from Australia into Indonesia has been growing 
rapidly. And um, there's a real opportunity, at least in Western Australia, where we've got a pretty solid cooperative to work as the as, uh, to work with us rather than trying to extract too much profit out of us. That we can move further into the value chain up there. And I think we're we're actively looking at opportunities for growers to get more involved in the supply chain into Asia. When I hear stories like Andrew's, it just fills me with hope that farmers will get ever smarter. So we just got to keep getting smarter. But Dave, if you've got a cool 45 million to invest, have I got a deal for you? <laughs> I'll talk to you later. <laughs> right. Thank you, I have a question up the back of the room. Uh, Tim Johnson, uh, Commonwealth Bank. The question for Andrew, um, just in terms of the production system with your high stocking rates on your cropping country, have you encountered any um, issues in terms of compaction and degradation? If so, how have you managed those? I think if it's really wet conditions uh, on our clay country, we'll, yeah. If it's, if it's waterlogging conditions, you need to be really careful, but <coughs> I guess when it's wet, you grow more grass, so there's less requirement, less pressure to graze the crops, and we'll just pick the paddocks that uh, on parts of the farms less likely to get waterlogged. So we sort of manage it, but yeah, I think when it is really wet, there's going to be some issues. But you've got to remember that where we are, every paddock is in a in a rotation involving livestock. So we don't seem to see the compaction issues that you do on the really deep soils of the Liverpool Plains and stuff, where they're really protecting those soil types. It's a I don't know if it's the different environment, the way the rain falls, you know, you know, more consistent in the Mediterranean climate, but um, we don't I, don't, I don't really see that as a, as a major issue or a major benefit from going to a no stock system. I, I can't see the, the neighbours who've got rid of all the stock having anything better than I've got. Good. Thanks very much, Andrew. I, I think today we've heard about the potential future and we've got David Brownhill very concerned about the future when we look at falling prices, increasing production around the world. And uh, I probably highlighted some of, the, some of the issues which are confronting the industry, especially uh, growers' profitability. But at the end of the day, we need to remember that you know, top 25% of growers across Australia are still doing very well. They're making very good returns on their investment. And that's because of a whole range of factors, whether it's location, management, the financial state of the business to start with. There's a, there's a whole raft of issues. From Andrew, we've seen how innovation can turn a business round and grow a business through even some very difficult seasons, although it is a very favoured and wonderful area uh, east of Esperance. You can still see what, what uh, innovation can do to a farming enterprise. I think it's beholden on the industry to promote that innovation from a research and development perspective to make sure that we're out there driving as hard as we can, looking for that that next, uh, that next great lift in productive uh, capability to make some of uh, our farmers more, more productive, but importantly, more profitable along the way. Uh, Christine, your, uh, your insight into quality assurance and quality of the Australian grain crop certainly has raised a lot of questions uh, that the industry does need to confront and look at and, uh, and work out how we go there, whether, there are, whether that's the future of the industry or whether it's the cost of the industry. I think the jury could still be out. Many will have a very firm view on that. But ladies and gentlemen, would you uh, join with me in thanking our panellists for a uh, informative session on grains at this outlook.